making sense of it all. Is it possible to make sense of it all? Here, in a, a box, I have a jigsaw puzzle in pieces. Is this what your life feels like sometimes? Just a jigsaw puzzle in pieces. And when you have a jigsaw puzzle in pieces like that, you don't even know whether all the pieces are there. That's the problem. And we don't know from all the components of our life whether we've got everything there that we need to make sense of it all. But this presentation is going to give you a little bit more information to build on what we had last time. I'm going to read you something from the Bible to begin with, because this is, as I said last time, this is where our information comes from. And it's from the book of Isaiah, and Isaiah chapter 14, and verse 14 says, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Do you remember last time we talked about an angel who was called Lucifer? Lucifer, when he was in heaven, meant light bearer. He was a beautiful angel, working very closely with God, had a very important position, but he became corrupted. Now I know the first question you're going to ask is, if he became corrupted, why did God not destroy him? But that is an answer for that, but it's for another time. And the next question you're going to ask is, if he became corrupted, how did he become corrupted? Now those are things that the Bible doesn't tell us. We would love those answers, but God doesn't tell us. But God does tell us how to cope with the situation we have now. And that's probably more important to us than digging and delving into things for which there's no answer. But Lucifer, this angel, wanted to become like God. He wanted the position of God. He wanted the authority of God. He wanted to rule. Now, the thing you must remember here is that when he wanted to be like God, it's talking about wanting a spiritual kingdom, not just a rulership of an earthly kingdom, but he wanted to have a rulership like God. So we'll discover as we go through these presentations that everything about Satan's attempts are all based on something spiritual. You need to remember that fact. So we know then that he wanted a kingdom. A kingdom has a throne. He wanted to be king. A kingdom not only has a throne, but it has laws. And a kingdom with laws and a throne needs subjects to rule over. And that's what Satan was requiring. Satan in heaven was actually very successful. He became known as Satan in the Bible later on because Satan means adversary or enemy. So he changed from Lucifer, the bearer of light, to being the adversary or the enemy of God. And that's another thing to remember. Sometimes we think that it's just us, but he is an enemy of God. And we were made in the image of God. And so therefore we're on the first line of attack. In heaven, war took place. We can hardly imagine that in heaven. And again, the Bible doesn't go into any idea whether it was an ideological war or whether it was real warfare, maybe as we know it today, but we're not told. But we do know that he was thrown out of heaven and he came to our planet. Now, I know that you're saying that's not fair, but God gave Adam and Eve, the first two human beings, ample warning about Satan, who was now on the earth. And he told them not to go to a certain tree and certainly not to eat the fruit of the tree. It was Eve that met Satan, first of all. And he met with Eve beside the tree. She must have gone to the tree out of curiosity. Again, we're not told, but she was by the tree. And she heard a voice talking to her from the tree. Now that's a very fascinating thing. 
if you heard a voice coming out of a tree and she listened to this voice and the voice tempted her and the voice said to her has God said that you can't eat of any of the fruit of any of the trees in the garden and she thought that's that's nonsense the fruit in the trees in the garden is what God's given us to eat so she said no we can eat of the fruit of the trees of any of the trees in the garden but we're not to touch one tree and Satan said to her what what is the problem with eating of the fruit of the tree and she said if we eat of the fruit of the tree God has said that we will die in fact God has given us one commandment and that commandment says thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree now that was a difficult thing God had told them not to eat of the fruit of the tree. It was the one commandment that he'd given them. And he said, if you do break that commandment, the result will be death. Adam and Eve, of course, had no idea what death was. They'd never seen it, because everything in the Garden of Eden was alive and vital. But the devil said to her, no, that's wrong. In the day you eat of it, you will be wise. It's not that you will die. Now Eve was really interested because this tree looked good. It was beautiful. And she thought about it as she looked at it. And she looked at the fruit and she thought that would be good to eat. And then she thought it's not only a fruit that's good to look at, but it made me wise. What is it that God's not been telling us about? What is it that we don't know that perhaps we ought to know? I'd like to know more about that. And she took a piece of the fruit. She ate a piece of the fruit. And then she took a piece of fruit to her husband. And Adam also ate of the tree. They very soon discovered what that wisdom was. It wasn't in any shape or form a pleasant wisdom. They felt afraid. They felt guilty and never before had they experienced that and not only that they discovered that they were naked before that they had been so innocent they had not realized things had really changed the bible tells us that adam and eve sewed fig leaves together to make garments for themselves they realized they were naked now each evening the lord god walked in the garden and talked with Adam and Eve and they knew that God was coming and they felt so afraid and so guilty that they hid and then as evening came and it became chill and cool tonight they were different they felt different they didn't want to see God they didn't want to hear God but God said Adam where are you and Adam came out from his hiding place and God looked at him. God knew what had happened. And God said to Adam, have you eaten of that tree? And he, Adam immediately replied, it was the woman she gave me to eat. But he also added, it was the woman that you gave me she gave me to eat of the tree. Now isn't this exactly what we do today if we are caught? We blame somebody else, not my fault, nothing to do with me. It was him, it was her. This is why I lost my temper, it was circumstances. And the very first words that Adam uttered after he had sinned were to blame someone else. He blamed Eve, yes. But did you notice that he blamed God? That's where it all begins. People today are still blaming God. And then God looked at Eve and said, Have you eaten of the tree? And she said, The serpent, the serpent tricked me. So both of them were blaming each other, blaming God, and they were thoroughly miserable. 
There was no way out. They tried. Just like the hostage who was chained up, the hostage in the cell, who tried to find coping strategies by having imaginary lectures, by having parties, by learning things, by trying to teach himself things. They developed coping strategies. Did the hostages' coping strategy work? No. Did Adam and Eve's coping strategy work? No. They were hostages. The chains had closed about them and there was no way out. The hostage in the Middle East, after a very short period of time, began to wonder, is there anybody helping me back home? What about my girlfriend? What about my colleagues? What about my boss? What about my family? Does anybody even know where I am? Do they care? Is anybody working on my behalf or talking to governments? What Adam and Eve didn't realise was that they needed a next of kin, just like the hostage in Syria, because a next of kin is the one that cares most about us, the one that loves us, the one that wants to get us out of these difficult situations. They needed a next of kin and they did not know if they had a next of kin. All this was new to them. They were told by the Lord God that they did have a next of kin. The next of kin was to be Jesus Christ, a redeemer, one who would come and buy them back. And it was interesting because what they had been promised by God as a result of breaking the commandment was that they would die. Adam and Eve didn't die that day, but something else did, because God took away their fig leaf garments and he made them coats of skins. And if you have coats of skins, that has to come from an animal. And so, if you like, they were clothed with the life of somebody else. And this is what God promised them, that one day a Redeemer will come. He will die. But for now, you must live under the life of a substitute. But time went by and Eve didn't know when this substitute was coming, nor did Adam. But she had a son and she thought she was sure that this was going to be their next of kin that would help them out of their situation. But we know from the Bible that sin developed. Abel was a good man. He obeyed God in everything. He followed the ways of God. But Cain, his brother, Cain hated Abel because Abel was the good boy. Isn't that just the same as today? Where people say, oh, goody, goody. And that's how Cain thought about Abel. And he didn't stop at just giving him verbal abuse. He murdered him. Adam and Eve did not know how this could resolve itself. But after many years after they lived, a Bible prophecy was written. And this is the words of this Bible prophecy. And I'm going to read from Isaiah, I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 61. The Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. This was the prophecy that came. And it went on to say even further, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. So there was not only the promise of a Redeemer that would come, but a God that would take the whole situation into his own hands so that Adam and Eve and human beings that trusted him could go free time we learnt that Satan is time limited and this again is saying the same thing. God will proclaim a day when he will declare vengeance. 
He will make good all that has gone wrong. Those that have been killed like Abel, the Lord will avenge. The Lord will put right. He's even said that the years that the caterpillar have eaten, that the locust have destroyed, all those disappointments that all of us get in life and feel in life, God knows. They're all recorded in his book. One day, all those wasted years that we struggle with now will be made up to us forever. That is the promise that God made to us. And so the Redeemer came. The Redeemer was born as a baby in Bethlehem, born on the same terms as we are, to live our life, to walk in our shoes, to know our difficulties. And when he went into the synagogue, he preached, and these were the words that he preached. And Luke chapter 4, verse 17 says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, that's Isaiah, it's quoting from the words that we've just read. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news, to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. These are the promises. And when Jesus came, Jesus died for us. Adam and Eve should have died in the Garden of Eden. We should never have had a life or even an opportunity. But God has given us an opportunity of life. We may not like that life, but the good tidings that he's offering us are to look to him. Because if we look to him, he will give us all the help that we need. He can change our lives so that we can have something better to look forward to when that day comes when he will put things right. That's why we have a lifespan. That's why we have 70 years or just a little more so that we can examine the evidence in the Bible, so we can look to see what Jesus has said. We can listen to his invitations to say, come. And if we do come to him, we shall find the kindest of next of kin that really understands us.